So I suppose since I'm putatively the moderator of this panel, I'll get started. And um, I think uh, I, I won't introduce you all. You can do a better job of introducing yourselves. Um, but I did want to sort of set some, some ground rules for what we're going to talk about. So Stephanie and I, as journalists, we're not scientists. Um, we don't have training in science, uh, really. So we're going to leave the error detection up to uh, Elizabeth and James. And then she and I can talk about some of the downstream implications of, of the work that, that you, you both have been doing and um, you know how that fosters or undermines a, a trust in science or mistrust in science and um, you know what it all has to do with with openness so um, at least since you're on the top right for me at least why don't you get started and, and talk a bit a little bit about your background uh, how you came into the world of error detection uh, and, and a little bit about that very interesting path because I don't know I assume that most of the participants here know a little bit about you um, but you've really been doing some remarkable work uh, with, with looking for uh, problems with images in particular. Yeah, um, I also have some slides, I don't know, because uh, how can I talk about my work without actually showing something? So uh, if that's okay, I am going to pull that up. Let's see. And you should be seeing my start slides, I hope. Yep. Um, all right, great. So. Yeah, so I have uh, worked 15 years in uh, academia at Stanford, uh, working on, on microbes that uh, live inside our bodies. And as a side hobby, I started to work on detecting plagiarism and images in uh, scientific papers. And I turned that into my full-time job a couple, about two years ago. And so the work that I do is, is looking at images in biomedical papers. And I specifically look for duplications. I cannot look, I cannot find a good Photoshop, but I can find an image if it overlaps, for example, with another image or it's, it's just duplicated in another paper. So I've pulled a couple of examples here that show sort of the different types of example, uh, different types of duplications that I've spotted in papers. And uh, on the left, on the top left, you can see a bunch of panels and I've marked two sets in uh, red boxes and with blue boxes, two sets of panels that are identical. So that's a sort of a simple duplication. And this could just be an error. Uh, still, it should not be the same, uh, the same uh, photos because these represent all different experiments. So it's still an error and I feel it should be corrected. So these are all from papers that have been, have been uh, peer reviewed and published and, and uh, so I'm looking at these papers and finding errors like these. So simple duplication, but I'm also finding reposition duplication. So those are the two examples shown on the top and the bottom right. You'll see there overlapping panels or uh, Western blots that are shifted or, or they could also be mirrored or rotated, things like that. And so those are reposition duplications and they're a little bit less likely to be a simple error. Maybe this was intentional or it's very sloppy. Somebody just didn't label their, uh, their samples very well or even rotated them. And on the bottom left, you can see sort of the worst examples. This is uh, a duplication with, um, within a photo. So you see a bunch of photos there. And in panel A, you see lanes one and three that I've marked with a blue box. Uh, those look exam uh, identical to each other. And in panel D, you see uh, three examples, three lanes that are all looking identical to each other. And so basically this is, uh, this is like looking at a photo of, uh, of a dinner party and you see Uncle John three times. That's not really what you would expect in the same photo. Um, it seems very likely that this photo is photo photoshopped and this was done intentionally. So I, I looked at 20,000 papers, uh, scanned them all by eye, and I found about 800 of 800 of those papers to contain such duplicated figures as I showed in the previous slide. So that's 4%. And uh, so half of those we, we estimated were intentionally uh, duplicated. And I reported all of these to the journal editor. So 800 papers were reported by me. Um, and now we are five or six years later. And unfortunately, even though these all contain big errors or, or even intentionally photoshopped images, only 40% of these papers have been corrected or retracted. So if you focus on the, the left bar, you can see all the 782 papers that are reported five years ago or more. 
and um, uh, about um, 20 something, 28 or so percent were corrected, uh, about 10% were retracted, and 60% have not been, uh, yeah, not been touched by the journal. They're still out there with their error or with their Photoshop or, or their overlapping image. And so I think that's very frustrating. We all say science is self-correcting, but it seems that most journals do not respond to these things and, and, and take a very long time or, or don't address these items at all. So these are my slides and my background and look forward to hear from uh, the other panelists. So I, I have a question for you. Um, when you started, was your, um, did you have any preconceptions about why you were seeing these problems? Did you think that it was mostly misconduct? Did you think that it was mostly honest error or maybe not slop sloppiness say? I mean, we do know from the retraction literature that of the retracted papers, roughly two thirds result from misconduct. Um, and a lot of those, uh, a lot of that statistic comes from you now uh, with the work that you've done and, and what you found. But as you say, half of the, of the problems that you found were, were not misconduct. So um, were you surprised by that? Were you surprised at how sloppy or, or um, I mean, shoddy, I guess the work was? Or, uh, and what have you learned you know, since you published that paper, which was several years ago? Oh, and I, I should add, yeah, why don't you tell the audience, um, how easy was it for you to get that paper published? Oh, that was very hard. That and, was very hard. I think we submitted it uh, five, six, seven times before it got, uh, uh, in, in the end, we just uh, put it on BioArchive. That was uh, still pretty revolutionary those days, uh, 2016. And uh, yeah, we, we submitted it to several journals and, and uh, it was all sent back like this is, we don't believe that you did this. Like I, I heard that a lot. Like we don't believe that a human can scan 20,000 papers uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And we don't, we don't think you are right. We think uh, there's no, golden standard like like you claim that these are duplications and and who who knows that if you have that gift like nobody can check you and so yeah no it was, it was very hard to get it published <laughs> and based on um oh well so i'll let you answer the first part of the question which was were you surprised at what you found and then if you could also say um so you looked at a slice of twenty thousand papers there are two point some million papers published a year so can we assume that you know the it's a hundred x difference or and you know, the... uh, yeah, it's hard to know. So uh, to answer the first part, was I surprised? I actually now suspect that um, more than half of these are done intentionally. And, um, but it's hard to know. Like if, if I look at a paper and I see a duplication like that and an author sends in, says, oops, I made a mistake. Here's a new set of papers. Like it's hard for me to know if they're speaking the truth or if they quickly sent in something that wasn't photoshopped or, or something like that. When it's a Photoshop, when it's that category three, that those um, duplications within a photo, I'm pretty sure it's intentional, but there's a lot of gray zone where I'm not quite sure. So um, I think, yeah, it's hard to know. We, we, we guessed it was half, half of them intentionally, but who knows, it might be more. And the, what was the other question? sort of looking prospectively you looked at twenty thousand papers but that's a tiny right. fraction of the number of papers that are published every year are you <laughs> i mean when you look at the publication say since 2000 to 2020 uh 2019 are you seeing the same level if you were to do a sampling or is it is it getting better or worse i i would say that in in, in the journals that i scanned and i found these duplications in it's getting uh, better so it's going down uh, because those journals are in general a little bit more attentive now to these things and try to capture them, catch them before they get published. So during somewhere during the submission process, uh, uh, particularly PLOS One is has greatly stepped up and increased their guidelines for image uh, preparation. And so they're finding more of these. And I haven't checked, but I would expect fewer, to find fewer of these if I would scan their papers now. But I also see a lot of influx from uh, papers that are produced by paper mills, which are sort of the scientific uh, plants that are, or yeah, uh, we don't really know, but it's like uh, labs that make scientific papers, that make fake scientific papers and sell them to authors who need a paper for their career. And those are, those don't always contain duplicated images, but they can 
can contain a whole range of other problems. And, and those are uh, those are on the rise for sure. And uh, my, at some in some fields have taken over their field. And it seems that almost every paper in particular fields might be a paper mill paper. Well, I encourage any participants to go to, to Elizabeth's blog and, and look at some of the work she's done on paper mills. We've certainly covered uh, the, the fruits of that when it comes to retraction, but I believe that there are many other paper mill papers that have yet to be retracted, but the numbers in the hundreds probably deserves to be in the thousands, uh, if, not, if not more. Um, let's, let's shift over to, to James, who's also a recovering academic, um, but uh, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm recovered, sunshine. Fully recovered? Congratulations. Um, so talk a little bit, what, what, what Elise does with looking at images, for me, I, my eyes don't work that way, my brain certainly doesn't work that way, but um, you uh, came up with a couple of uh, data analysis tools, which in theory are, are easy for humanities major like me to apply. So talk a little bit about why you did did that grim and sprite I'm thinking of and, um, and you know, how that came about, how you applied them, what you found and, uh, and, and tell us, you know, whether uh, that sort of thing is, is becoming more common in your view or should be. Well, all the tests that we have, which between me and the erstwhile Dr. Nick Brown, I think is for now formally, although we have a, a variety of other methods for crowbarring uh, method section and raw data open, all arose because they were retrofit for things that we didn't trust. It was never a matter of I'm sitting around thinking of the statistical mechanics, which is something that I rarely do. It was the matter of we see things that can't possibly be true and we need to find a, a kind of an empirical loophole within how the numbers were generated or the process that they arose from that says this is a reliable observation that makes enough sense in context that it will give us at least a partial answer on whether or not um, the elements that we see numerically can exist. And generally when they work, uh, they work very well. It's a, it's, a matter of, it's a matter of their application like most things. What were the other components of a question? You're one of these multi-question gentlemen, aren't you? Sorry. Um, so, well, let me, let me jump in first to say, um, so if you and uh, Nick Brown were, had this sort of, for lack of a better word, bullshit meter, which triggered in you the desire to figure out how to retrofit some tool to look at the data, why, and this is a large rhetorical question, but I want to hear your answer. Why weren't journal editors and peer reviewers figuring out the, these uh, studies, and we can talk about some in particular if you like, um, really you know, didn't pass muster before they published them? Oh, what does that good, say about- that's a, good, that's a good question. Well, there's a proximal and a distal reason for that. Um, the proximal reason is that in general, you review only the paper that comes in front of you. You're in a hurry. And peer review has never really seen its job as interrogating the information that's in front of it. It's seen as a process of interrogating the process that's in front of it. So when most things get spiked, at least in my experience, and I've had plenty of people tell me that my paper is naughty and that it shouldn't be published, it's a matter of this was conducted incorrectly. This, you, took, you took the wrong observations. You don't have enough certainty. You haven't read a sufficient amount of background. And rarely is any form of computational reproducibility part of that equation. So that's the proximal reason. The distal reason is that a lot of the time when we've had skepticism about a certain author or a certain paper, it's in the environment of other things that they've done things that they've said, things that they've published, things that have happened elsewhere. So I'll give you an example. If a paper came in front of your desk, uh, Adam, who is now the editor, and it's a perfectly fine paper, maybe a bit trivial, seems perfectly all right, you would evaluate that paper. Well, what we would do is say 21 first author papers, most of them sole author papers in a year involving field experiments with no funding, where half of these models sound like something that was invented by a particularly inattentive undergraduate, I don't believe 
that this process is happening on a kind of a macro career scale, the way that it's being presented. Um, you, could, you could apply that immediately to COVID research right now. You did an RCT on patients that turned up within that particular time window. You got everything together in what, three weeks? Um, then you recruited all of those people. They all followed the instructions precisely. They all managed to finish their data collection. Everything was perfectly okay. Insert Will Farrell meme, I don't believe you. So that's, I, I'm gonna display, I think some philosophical ignorance, but is that sort of a Bayesian approach to, to looking at scientific research and literature? No, I don't, I don't, I don't get to wear that hat. It's a skeptical approach. Um, right. There's a ba ba Bayesian, Bayesian analysis in some forms informs what we do, but um, it, it only has the, the, the loosest kind of uh, collective association to the actual process itself. Um, can I, if you mind, don't mind, I'd like to kick it over to Stephanie now because you mentioned uh, COVID research and uh, Stephanie is doing more than just about any other person on the planet, certainly more than any other person with a typewriter to um, inform the public about what's trustworthy and what's not when it comes to COVID research. And Stephanie, if you could talk a little bit about your process when uh, it comes to evaluating uh, science when it's informing a story that you're writing uh, for BuzzFeed or um, you know, what, how do you approach, let's, let's talk about the ivermectin story, for example, which is really important. Yeah, sure. So I just want to start off by saying that um, James and Elizabeth have done so much amazing work to improve science and science is better off because of them. Um, I'll just speak briefly to the, the small part that you and I play in this whole ecosystem as journalists, um, with the caveat that I'm getting over a cold, not COVID. So forgive me. Um, so yeah, I'm a science reporter at BuzzFeed News. I've been here for six years. Um, as we've all established by now, science is a very human enterprise and humans get it right a lot of the time, but mess it up uh, occasionally to often. Um, so Elizabeth and James and data sleuths like them, you know, their job is to, to find errors. And in a lot of my work over the last few years, I've had an overlapping but distinct task, which is to try to understand like why and how those mistakes come to happen in the first place. Um, often, errors are a result of unintentional sloppiness, but sometimes there does seem to be more of like a willful intent to deceive or cover things up. Um, so, you know, my goals as a journalist are, you know, um, hopefully the scientific community will learn from these stories, lessons that will help it get it right in the long run. Um, I want to echo the journalist panel yesterday in saying that <clears throat> I also hope that the public will learn to associate science with principles that are like so core to science but aren't always communicated clearly, which is nuance and uncertainty and gradual consensus rather than black and white answers and solutions. Um, and then finally, a thing I've learned about science is that frankly, scientific institutions tend to be extremely stubborn and opaque. Um, so by reporting on them, I hope to try to make them a little bit less so. Um, so, you know, in my job, reporting consists of, you know, interviewing people, asking questions and getting answers on the record, filing public records requests. I can consult experts who don't have a dog in the fight. I can in independently vet both sides of a story and lay it all out for readers. And um, I can use my position at a mainstream media outlet that reaches millions of people to try to get answers out of people um, or institutions or try anyway. Um, the ivermectin story is something that I wrote about a couple weeks ago. Um, so for those who are maybe not aware, ivermectin is like <clears throat> the COVID drug of choice. Right now, last year is hydroxychloroquine, but that was 2020 and 2021. It's all about ivermectin, um, which is like this deworming drug that's been around for decades. And like a certain segment of the population is convinced that it can either like prevent you from getting COVID or it can like cure you outright. Um, and a lot of these people um, are, are choosing to take it instead of getting vaccinated, which is very concerning because there's no reliable evidence for ivermectin. So anyway, the story I wrote about most recently with this was um, there was a, a clinical trial done in Argentina last year. And it said that it gave ivermectin to like hundreds of healthcare workers in hospitals in Argentina. Um, and it turned out that ivermectin was 100% effective at preventing all of them from getting COVID, uh, which is like pretty remarkable. Like 100% is, is uh, pretty amazing, I would say. Can't, can't really get better than that. 
Um, but then these two data sleuths, uh, Gideon Meyer with Katz and Kyle Sheldrick, started looking more closely at the study, which was being cited by people who were pro ivermectin um, and, and citing it as a reason to not get vaccinated. And um, they found a lot of issues with them, which was um, data for the participants, like just didn't match up internally. Um, and then you look closer and uh, supposedly four hospitals carried out this experiment. Well, one of them says that it actually never participated and has no idea why it's in the study. Um, officials in Buenos Aires said that they had no record of like ever approving the study. Um, and this study was published within a week of submission in a journal that's published like 10 articles in the last two years, like total. And it's all, all its lifespan. Um, so, you know, the, these errors were raised by Gideon and Kyle, and um, I was very interested in this because obviously ivermectin, as I said, is like a very hot subject right now. Um, so I came in and I just started trying to um, gather their evidence, ask questions, like trying to verify to what extent this trial was actually conducted as advertised um, and involved, you know, talking to all these doctors in Argentina and then finally talking with the the investigator himself who um, says that the study was conducted exactly as he said in the study. Um, so uh, nevertheless, there's a lot of inconsistencies in the story and that's what I try to lay out in, in the story and you know, um, let people come to their own conclusions. But um, that's an interesting case where, you know, at least talked about journals not really doing anything about problems that are brought to their attention um, this journal, which is the Journal of <clears throat> Biomedical uh, Research and Clinical Investigation, like uh, ch changed its changed its submission fee after I asked, um, you know, like how much it charged scientists to submit to the journal, and then it took down the study for like three days when I asked about like all these questions about the study and then put it back online and said, well, the scientist told us that he had explained everything to the media. So that's why we put it back online. Um, but uh, it, it did change the, the hospital that said it never participated to uh, other peripheral medical center in the study without like actually changing or removing any of the data. Um, so, you know, uh, journals are like not great keepers great gatekeepers normally. Um, this one seemed to have done like a less than thorough job in reviewing it, I would say. So, some have no gates. Um, so <laughs> let's, um, I'd like to ask you as a science journalist, so what is, uh, and if you could talk about the misconduct cases or other cases, related cases you've worked on, um, what sort of you know, rises to the level that it's going to get your attention. Um, I mean, is it all about clicks? Is there something that appeals to you, Stephanie Lee in particular? And, and have you noticed over the last six years any common threads in the stories that that you've covered when it comes to to difficulties in science with honesty, say, or openness? Um, I'll start with the first question, which is just like, how do I decide when to write about something? Um, it's a good question. Um, as you know, at Retraction Watch, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of errors happening in, in papers all the time. Uh, I cannot investigate every single one of them. I just like simply don't have the bandwidth. Um, so and I'm we thank you for not having <laughs> uh, I, I thank you for doing the service that you do. Um, but so I'm looking, so I try not to bring more attention in the debunking of something than what it originally you know, gained. Um, I'm looking for influence on policy, on people's health, on culture. I'm looking at money. Um, did the theory borne out by the study, you know, lead somebody to make a lot of money? And like, if so, who are they? Um, a couple of years ago, I mean, I don't think, I don't feel like anyone attending a meta science conference needs like a refresher and Brian Wansink and James Heather's like least of all. Uh, but I'll just quickly, very quickly recap that case, which was, um, you know, in 2017, 2018, the leader of the food and brand lab studying food psychology and marketing research at Cornell, Brian Wansink, um, he uh, was 
you know, on the Today Show, on magazine covers, um, had tons of grant money, had tons of papers out. And his whole thing was um, science-backed strategies to help you like lose weight and uh, eat better without really like overhauling your diet or your exercise just by like making some small changes to your environment. And um, this like made him like the most famous, you know, food psychology researcher of his kind, I would say. Um, but as James and, you know, other data detectives found out, uh, dozens of these studies had shoddy data in them that like just didn't um, add up uh, when you looked at them from the outside. And then um, what I figured out, like by obtaining emails between researchers involved in doing these studies was that um, they were actively like engaging in this activity of starting with like a headline or conclusion that they thought would be really interesting and then like trying to cherry pick or otherwise be hack their data to, to make it fit that conclusion. Um, so, I mean, this was somebody whose advice had like, like touched so many lives, had influenced like policies, had influenced uh, schools that were trying to design their cafeterias to get kids to eat better. You know, he had best-selling books, like, uh, his his impact on the culture um, and on on the scientific landscape was was huge, um, and so I felt like it was worth digging into that to ex explore and to, to explain to people that the, this uh, the science back strategy you thought was like so solid is, is maybe is definitely is not not so much. Um, so so I look for influence in in sort of the conventional sense. I would also say I look for um, influence in, there's, there's many other ways that harmful or shoddy science can be influential. Um, like with the ivermectin study, um, I remember when we, we put out the story, somebody tweeted at me like, this story is, or the study is not influential. It was published in like, to use their words, a predatory journal that nobody reads. But the study had been like cited um, at a U.S. Senate hearing, and it was, <coughs> excuse me, it was talked about on Joe Rogan's podcast, and if you don't know, like Joe Rogan, his, his podcast reaches millions and millions of people, um, so I, you know, influence is not just about number of citations um, with, with a paper, even though, you know, that's a conventional thinking in the scientific community, it, it can take all kinds of different forms, so I'm paying attention to, to what those different forms could be. And I've not forgotten whatever else you were asking me, Adam. <laughs> um, I'd like to I'd like to move on because um, you know it occurs to me, and this is for for James and Elise, um, and maybe more for Elise. But um, what is what's the goal in in doing what you've been doing with with error detection and and sort of policing the literature? Ultimately, what where do you see this going? Obviously, we're never going to completely do away with misconduct. We're never going to do away with shoddy research. So, you know, what do you hope to to achieve? For me, it's it's just um, uh, flagging papers that might have a problem and, and making that available to other readers. Because as I've shown you, like it takes too much time for a journal to respond to these concerns if you raise them uh, in the official way. Uh, so I, I just post everything on Papier and hope that people use Papier to, uh, uh, during the literature search just to make the reader aware that there might be a particular problem in figure three of a particular paper, or there might be a particular problem with a particular author. And, and so I just hope that I can scan as many papers as humanly possible. That's sort of my goal and flag what I think is of concern. And of course I cannot detect a lot of problems. Um, like I would not have been able to detect the surgery sphere problem I focus, I focus on, on the things I can do best and I hope that others do what they can do best and flag that. Because in the end, if you base your paper, if you base your research on a paper that contains either an error or misconduct, you might waste as a researcher a lot of effort and research money trying to replicate that. And if it never happened or if it contains an error, we need to warn other people to, to you know, proceed with caution and don't base your research maybe on this particular paper. Yeah, component answer to that. Um, I can't do what police does and I've tried. Um, one single solitary time I have found a visual error 
in a manuscript in the wild. And I, I was so happy. I, um, I did a little dance for a while, um, which is uh, wildly out of proportion compared to some of the more numerical problems that we've found. But my interpretation of that question, Adam, is you're asking, what's, this, what's essentially the end game here? Where do we end up? Why begin in the first place? The simple answer is when we discovered that this was a thing, and I was working with Nick early in 2015, and he was just a mad old man I met. Um, it was compelling, and it was, it was an interesting problem. And I saw a gigantic disparity between what I thought was the importance of the problem and the amount of attention that was being paid to it. The end game is a little more complicated. Globally, I feel like from the perspective of structural funding, uh, and trust and support, um, the interface between science and the public, et cetera, Science has slid to a certain degree within the public consciousness in a way that annoys me. And often there is simply not, and there are too many people and not enough money. This is a structural problem we have built for ourselves um, because of the kind of global environment of fiscal austerity over the last couple of decades, um, which we managed to fill the hole with hopeful PhD students who eventually we can disappoint when they meet reality's job market. And there are not a lot of structural tools where you can push any button whatsoever to say the publication environment is overheated. A lot of papers shouldn't have been published in the first place. Much of this is never read carefully. Um, somewhere between a quarter to a half of editors are actively bad at uh, pursuing quality control as opposed to the other metrics um, that are relevant within their journal and that everyone is right to have a certain degree of skepticism within the bounds, of course, of the fact that, that science is real and that empiricism can actually be established. Now, there are very few things that you can do. Uh, in your underpants on your couch in the middle of the night that allow you to make that point incredibly loudly to the extent where someone like Stephanie would write about what you're doing. So um, I'd like to ask, uh, I mean, you talk about editors in sort of indifference, and it occurs to me that, you know, so you and Elizabeth are both in a sense outsiders uh, in in this endeavor, right? And so you can bring a certain amount of of distance and maybe cynicism, skepticism. It's there are some editors who have been instrumental in uprooting and unrooting uh, a tremendous amount of fraud in their particular uh, literatures. I'm thinking, for example, of in anesthesiology, which is the reason that we got into Retraction Watch to begin with. Um, Steve Schaefer, who was the editor of a publication called Anesthesia and Analgesia. Um, I wouldn't say single-handedly, uh, but there weren't that many other hands helping him uh, uncovered three of the largest fraud cases in science history, certainly in modern science history. Fuji, um, Saito, and Sato. Uh, Fuji, um, uh, uh, Scott Rubin, who was sort of the first. Oh, and, and Bolt. And uh, Bolt. So, but then, but the rest came, right? So, um, you know, so if you look on the Retraction Watch leaderboard, uh, two, the first two or two of the first three, at least for anesthesiologists and, and Steve was responsible for that. But I will say that his predecessor at the journal um, was responsible for burying the, the Scott Rubin case for a decade when he refused to uh, retract a paper. Um, I'm sorry, Fuji, the uh, Fuji case, when he refused to, to uh, retract a paper that clearly had falsified data. So your point is well taken. Um, but as outsiders, do you think um, do you think you're you're, you're helping the the um, the patient, uh, or uh, but at the same time, sort of possibly risking public trust in science by exposing uh, you know so much, so many problems that maybe the public Stephanie will write about and the public will think, hey, what's what's going on here? These people are all corrupt. And I know well, that's a little bit of a straw man, but please address why that's no, not no, the case. No, it's not. It's not a straw man at all. But also, I mean, the, the 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 immediate component response to that is that trust is supposed to be earned. It's not supposed to be when you you are within certain arms distance of a pipette, everything goes away. 
um, and that we have a, a blanket assumption that everything is conducted appropriately. Um, the the, the in, inherent response to that is that we are really genuinely supposed to keep our house in order. If you want to wear the mantle of trust as we are the, we are the people who push forward the collective knowledge of humanity, if you want to wear that, then you have to have a tremendous internal resistance to your own processes where mistakes are made. And there needs to be a solid appreciation of the work that goes into pointing out the fact that they exist. I mean, your, your point from anesthesiology and analgesia is extremely well taken because that is a medical journal, which are generally the fanciest journals that we have, um, the ones that sell the most advertising space, the longest, the longest running, the best known. Um, it is a, a, a proper journal with a proper impact factor for any given value of proper. Um, and it's reasonably well regarded within those circles. Now, if, the, if, if we're talking that the, the editors in that case say we're, we're one out of two uh, from, from a hit rate of would they be willing to deal with this, you can, you can imagine what happens to a regional journal within the social sciences when you turn up and say literally none of this paper that you published six years ago happens. The, the, the disinterest is wonderful and stunning. But I, I want to know what Elise thinks because I always want to know what Elise thinks. Um, I'm I am worried that um, uh, you know, people like uh, like Nick and James and and I hopefully we're we're trying to find errors and we're trying to clean our house and but the the lots of journal editors are not responding. They're they're not responsive or they're uh, listening. They're 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 uh, taking other sets of, of images that the authors have submitted and, and just doing a correction when I'm just looking at the image and it was like completely photoshopped. I'm seeing lots of gullible and, and maybe even corrupt editors who are just not addressing these things. And, and I am very worried that the general audience is looking at all these retractions we've had uh, with COVID-19 and we'll conclude that science is not to be trusted because you know all these papers shouldn't have been accepted in the first place. And uh, yeah, if, if other people then find big errors, then how can we trust the whole system? And I, I do feel that you know, we already have so much misinformation in science uh, and, and, and online that part of the work I'm doing could be misinterpreted that science is not to be trusted. And I hope that people actually look at people like me who who try to clean up science, but we need more editors and publishers um, to, to work on retracting all these papers or correcting them. And uh, I see a cat in the view, and so I'm completely distracted now. <laughs> but yeah, we need, to, we, need more, we need more action and faster. And I've been in a lot of talks where words like stakeholders uh, are used a lot. And if I hear that word, I'm like, okay, that's just a beautiful word, but there's no action. We need action. We need institutions who take actions as well. And there's too little of that. Stephanie, th does that ever cross your mind when you're reporting on a story? Um, you know, gee, I, 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 I'm worried that this one is really going to chip away at the public's confidence in, in science and scientists. Or is it just, you know what, if you, if you came to my attention, then you deserved it. And so tough luck. I kind of feel the latter. I mean, again, I'm looking for <laughs> I'm looking for instances that people are gonna have heard about. Again, that's by way of like, did they raise a lot of money because of this? Did they, you know, did this change policies? Did this change? Did this affect people's health? So I look for you know high stakes situations um, to to sum it up. So um, yeah, if if an idea that is the foundation for that, for the, 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 the adoption of, of, of it in the real world is found to be shoddy, then I think, um, you know, it, it deserves to be exposed because so many people hear about like, oh, this, this amazing discovery is made and like, there's inherently so much less attention paid to the like, oh, it didn't actually work, except in some rare instances. Um, I agree with James that like trust needs to be earned and, you know, by, by any institution, by any set of people, and that you can't just be granted automatically. Mm. But look, the, 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 when, when we shape all that out, scientists can be very two-speed on this. They can be incredibly distrustful of other scientists 
of other experimental techniques, of other processes, of other labs. And they have their own internal communication networks for whether or not something is worth paying attention to or not. And some of that is very critical. It's very cutting. But at the same time, the idea of losing collective faith in what we do is, is regarded as kind of, you, you can't possibly do that. We're the good people. Yeah. With the, with, the, with the people who are su supposed to be acting within this particular domain. Well, if that's the case, you can damn well act like it. Um, and you can go out and justify the fact right. that you, you wish to be, when they survey all the professions and who is the most trusted and wonderful people, if you want to be at the top, then we can act like and put processes in place such that this is the case. It's not if, it, if, if there's a, a certain degree to which, look, if we, if any of us are kicking anyone off a pedestal when it comes to something like this, the, the amount of people who don't get removed, the amount of things that can't be pursued, we are individual people in general working on individual projects. The amount of this that doesn't get done should be seen as kind of concomitant to the fact that there is a very small amount of deeply critical analysis going on within any realm of science. COVID has changed this to a very minor degree because in general, it's just resulted in, in a variety of different forms of cheerleading between people who are all very much enjoying their kind of mutual distrust. Adam, should we answer these questions of stacking up less than- Yeah, I was actually, that's exactly what I was gonna do, which is the, the, the question uh, much earlier, uh, well, was it was a statement about um, uh, the financial reasons to be unscrupulous, which you, dismissed a little bit um, yes. so so okay so what are the incentives at play here why what why are people doing this or maybe well, the, you can say the, like what are the vast majority of the time there, there are of course instances where people are um re reporting their phase two trials the wrong way around because they're trying to raise a, a series b funding for their company and they needed uh, something that they wrote within a scientific journal to be concomitant to the, the, all the amazing things that they were supposed to do but in general, it's simply the fact that attention and publication is currency within academia. And there is no direct financial incentive until you're talking about the sort of second and third order effects of I continue to be employed or I get promoted or I get the job I want. There's no immediate financial incentive a lot of the time. Um, but I mean, does that essentially amount to the same thing? Probably not when there are people out there who are faking things in the immediate set so they can literally make money because that's, that's very much a thing, although it's, um, th there are areas where it's more common. Um, medical devices in some areas of biotech, um, the places that I've seen personally, where it feels like people are lying for money in the immediate sense. Um, but the rest of it, honestly, is people trying to navigate a system where the demands on their time and lives do not belie the fact that they are doing things that are reliable. There are some really marvelous stories on your website, Adam, uh, which occasionally pop up, which is the junior group leader or the postdoc didn't have enough time to finish the project and didn't have funding and everything was, it was like the walls were falling in around the project. So they just sort of neatened up a few things where they probably shouldn't have. And then everything turned out fine, of course, until they got caught. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add to that about incentives and, and you know, why people behave badly? Well, I'm seeing a lot of uh, paper mill papers and, and, and that appears to be clearly driven by incentives. Uh, like these are people um, who are finishing medical school. This is particularly uh, happening in China where if you finish medical school and you wanna work at a hospital, but you're not interested really in research, uh, you wanna cure patients and, and, and you don't have time to do research, but you still have to publish a paper. And, and so this is an incentive, not, not really for these people because they're interested in science. They're not generally not interested in that, but they need to tick that box. They need to have a paper. Otherwise they cannot become a doctor. They cannot get a decent salary. And so they'll buy a paper and, and there's paper mills catering towards to, to serve these authors. And um, I think that's one of the incentives. If the incentive doesn't make any sense, if you ask people to do impossible things, then people will will cheat in order to arrive at that goal. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I do think that um, it doesn't take much reading around the subject to figure out that monetary incentives um, pervert 
a lot of enterprises in human behavior. Um, if you don't believe me, read the read the book about WeWork, um, which is a pretty great story about a way to make $10 billion and not have to do very much. But um, so, and I think that some data, and I might get the figure wrong, but um, there's some studies which suggest that one to 2% of scientists admit to misconduct in some form or another. Um, so if we assume that one to 2% of every field cheats, um, then it almost doesn't even really matter what the incentives are, right? Uh, the bigger problem, I think, than, than cheating if in mis the context of misconduct might be, um, you know, cutting corners, which isn't necessarily misconduct, but as James said, you know, you sort of have, you're under the gun and you got to do X, Y, and Z because that's the end. Um, so is that, you know, really fabricating data? Not necessarily. It could just be uh, choosing a, you know, a, choose p hacking, for example, or something else. But um, I, I do want to talk. So someone also raised a question um, about what to do with meta analyses, which is a fascinating question because there's so much of of the literature could potentially be tainted. I mean, we're not talking about half, but you know, some, some small fraction. And so, what should you do? And there are some tools, some library tools, Zotero and other things that will track retractions, and you can look at retraction watch. But that doesn't catch everything, and it doesn't catch all the just corrections and other things. So, what what do you, uh, James and Elizabeth, advise? Um, authors when it comes to trying to make sure your, your, your meta-analyses are, are up to snuff? Well, I, I have little experience or knowledge about meta-analyses and I'm very nervous about them because I, I get a similar question a lot and I just can look at a meta-analysis and it looks fine to me. Like I, I think it's hard for me, like I have my specialty and it's definitely outside of my comfort zone. Um, I've seen some very bad meta analyses where basically the same uh, the same study was was counted two or three times. Like one is a preprint print and one is the the real study. That seems bad to me, but that's sort of my basic understanding of meta analyses. And I'm yeah, I, I wish we had more people who would uh, make that their specialty and 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 start looking for errors in those papers. Um. Yeah. Somebody, sorry. Go ahead. Let me let me let me, uh, let me let me put a bookend on that. That we we uh, we just published uh, something by we. I think Kyle is here. Hello, Kyle. Um, and Gideon and Nick and Jack and myself just published a, a little correspondence in Nature Medicine, which essentially said, if we are going to do this, is specific now to uh, plague centric drug trials, um, but it could really be read more broadly. If we're going to do meta-analyses of papers that we can't trust, then we are we are going to have to look at individual patient data. We've had such an this whole ivermectin thing recently has been such an astonishing own goal for humanity in general and the scientific establishment in particular that it does not belie us simply trusting whatever turns up rating something that is numerically childish as a low risk of bias and then glomming it all together in, in a, uh, a, a, reasonably, a reasonably simple uh, omnibus result that says everything is fine. It won't do. We can't accurately answer questions like that anymore. People like me have to get involved and then you have to rewrite the meta-analysis where previously you said uh, everything is fine. We should treat people with this. This research has killed people. This research has affected government healthcare policy um, in, in places that, that have a, a, a shortage or an absence of vaccines. Um, there, there has to be a point past which when the, the question is sufficiently important that we don't simply accept the fact that meta-analysis of individual summary statistics is a good idea, simply because it's obviously not enough scrutiny. If the worst study in the whole world is getting through the, the, the checklist risk of bias assessment and then coming out the other side and then adding great fuel to the fire, which essentially amounts to organize your country differently and hope people don't die. This is, I, I mean, we have the tools to be able to do this. We have the collective understanding of how to navigate the ethical procedures. We know how to anonymize data. It's pathetic 
that this has is 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 a uh, a suggestion that's coming up again. Obviously, it's not particularly novel, but it's pathetic that it's coming up again now, and it has to be us that are doing it. We're sort of hard scrabble weirdos working in the middle of the night. Um, it, I mean, I'm going to be here, so I'm going to stop. Sorry, James, you, you froze out, but I think you made your point. Good. But unless you want to make it again. No. Um, Okay, uh, I'm just scrolling through the questions to see that, that I, I'm sure we, I missed some things. Um, somebody wrote, uh, what can I as a PhD student with no extra funding or financial resources do to A, look out for in, in any given paper and B, avoid making basic errors in my work, i.e. what are the best detection, error detection practices? Um, I, I can't answer that question, but perhaps uh, one of Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, look, here's, here's something that's heartening from that perspective. Um, the entirety of everything we've done has been, uh, well, the test development certainly has been uh, completely unfunded. Um, this is to, to my, well, I think one of the, 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 the lasting uh, annoyances that I have in general is that someone hasn't simply turned up uh, and, and given an enormous bag of money to Elise to do her work. Um, this is uh, it's a it's a particular bugbear of of mine that it is uh, it's something that is so obviously necessary and effective and so well done that it is not somehow deemed uh, with within the realm of things that could be considered for something. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, so if there's anyone out there who's listening, fund her, not me. Um, this is, I, I have, I have a job now, um, that I have to do for, for, for money. Um, and it would probably be a distraction at this point. And also her stuff is better. So what can I do? What can I do myself? Um, the vast, the vast majority of the, the computational tools and the sort of the headspace that you develop through using them, uh, is not something that costs any money. Um, if you read the, and of course, I mean, every, everything that we've ever done, the tools are available. Um, the, the statistical code is available. I mean, Sprite is, Sprite is available in three different programming languages. So you can, it's, it's simply a matter that there has not been a formal acceptance that has a nexus of this work that takes it out into, uh, takes it out into the, um, the, the syllabi of the world. It's, it's not it's not picked up and formalized and taught and that's not something that i can do myself and that's really the reason that people don't encounter it so i i will say and that's unfortunate um the uh john carlisle who's a, a british anesthesiologist they call him and he's this there um who developed the modeling to uh look at uh yoshitaka fuji's data um that has been sort of systematized uh in the anesthesia literature um in a way that you know, might be instructive as a model for for other things, um, and it can sort of s s sit as like a as a module or a plugin or something. It's pretty complex, more so than than Sprite and Grimm. But um, he he was not a he had no training in statistics other than being a medical doctor when he volunteered to go create this system. So um, mm. I guess the the bottom line is. Well, you, you, you seem dubious, but... Uh, no, no, I don't, it's, I don't think it's particularly complicated. It's the Stu Fisher test um, that was, was updated to work on uh, table one of... Uh, of it, it's, it's, uh, it's something that already existed. Um, Ronald, Ronald Fisher wrote about it a million years ago. He had the tremendous foresight to be able to apply it in context. But um, it's, it is... It's, I mean, it, it's, also, it's also a nice case where something like this could be turned into a procedure like that, because it's simply a matter of there's a, there's a, a computational requirement, it's a series of numbers, you plug it into a thing, and then everything behaves itself. I mean, it's a little more, bit more complicated than that, but not much. Um, there's an excellent preprint on this, actually, that I work for everyone with that was a couple of years old now. Um, I, I think he, they added his name to the test, so now it's Stu for Fisher Carlisle. Uh yeah, I wish we, it'd be nice to have that link. We could post it. But um, bottom line is, um, if you're so inclined, uh, you could make your own test, right? I mean, uh, it's not, it doesn't seem like there's magic, particularly. It's just an inclination and uh, the willingness to, to do it. But um, 
Any more questions? Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, Stephanie, do you have any final thoughts about um, you know sort of the state of uh, the state of uh, coverage of si of science these days and uh, um, well, if we're talking about solutions or, you know, attempts at solutions, I, I know it's like a broken record at <clears throat> this conference, but like posting data in full would like, you know, if required across the board would like alleviate, would make all of our lives uh, so much less busy and so much easier. Um, I recently did a story about um, Dr. Dan Ariely at Duke and um, a study that he did in 2012 about um, signatures standing at the top of a form, it found like would make you give more honest answers than if you sign at the bottom. And um, the key experiment in it turned out to have been based on fraudulent data, but that wasn't discovered until, you know, eight years after it was published in 2020 when they tried to replicate and it didn't work. And it was only when they posted the original data that other people were able to go into it and see like it didn't, just didn't add up. Um, so from 2012 to 2020, uh, it's kind of a nice evolution of like meta science and behavioral economics in, in general of like going from not posting being the default to more and more people posting being the default. Um, so, you know, I, I, if, it, if there's like one thing I think would make like a big impact, um, in, in transparency, um, and, in, in error detection, it would be that. We did, we didn't have time, unfortunately, to talk about the Ariely story which is unfolding as we speak it's very interesting and um i'm sure we all have our thoughts about what's going on there um so i'd like to take uh this time just to thank the presenters uh i found it fascinating i hope all the the attendees did um and thank the organizers for for convening this uh great uh, great hour and uh really interesting stuff so thank you all thanks everyone Thanks everyone. Thank you, Adam, for uh, hosting us. I didn't have a chance to show my cat. He's not cooperating, but oh. next year. Well, Need <laughs> more mine, cats. Mine, mine, mine is neither. I mean, the, 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 hug, <laughs> the hugs in generally are to prevent the cat going onto the keyboard. Um, <laughs> I, it's, yeah.